Hello, I'm Mark Pugac and welcome to Game On, the weekly football chat show from Mail Plus. So Euro 2020 has started with quite a lot of drama, but now with a lot of relief that Christian Eriksen is awake, stable in hospital and able to send messages to family and friends. We wish him the very best for his recovery. On the pitch, contrasting fortunes for England, Scotland and Wales. And with us to discuss all that, Alan McAnally, the former Scotland striker, Danny Murphy, the former England midfielder and Martin Samuel, the Daily Mail's chief sports writer. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all. Alan, we have to start with you. What are your thoughts this morning after Scotland's defeat? Uh, yeah, a little deflated. Uh, I mean, there was real optimism, to be honest, with the, with the way Stevie Clark has, has galvanated the team really over the last couple of years and got us to a position where we're even in the competition. Because after all, we did get into the back door, just, you know, penalties against Israel and Serbia. But I think going into the game, there was a real sense that we might actually get something this time. Um, but listen, we are where we are. We don't have an international football player on his own or in a front three that's going to score his goals at that level. And defensively, that's as good as we, we are. And, and we, we've got some really good individual players in the Scotland team. But I think yesterday, I mean, apart from an absolutely spectacular goal by Patrick Schick, which was just stunningly unbelievable. Maybe there's a bit of a reality in our result yesterday, and that's how good as much as we are. And unfortunately, as good a job as Stevie Clark's done, we're probably going to play three games and go home. Alan, did it feel like, as watching a game with, with your pal Ali McCoy, that with Tierney mm -hmm. injured, that, that great axis, the Tierney Robertson axis, obviously wasn't there. And particularly mm -hmm. first half, Scotland seemed a bit unsure of themselves because that attacking threat that they can normally rely upon wasn't present. Yeah, and yeah, Andy Robinson did really, really well. But in terms of him having to run all the way back, when Tierney would have been doing that job for him, he could have spent most of his time in that final third. There's no question that that weakens us terribly. I mean, that's like taking Kane out your team or taking, you know, the way Calvin Phillips played, for God's sakes, taking him out the, out the team. You know, and Kieran is such an important player. And you could probably argue that we're, we're as strong down the left-hand side as, as any of the teams in the competition. But... We are not at an international level for individual players, and that's the bottom line. Daddy, what did you think watching it? I thought they did all right at times. Um, obviously, a lack of quality in the final third. I was surprised to see Dykes playing ahead of Adams, um, Premier League striker. Hmm. A bit more about him, obviously. It was a strange decision, that one, for me. I couldn't see why. That was, you know, and he tried to change that, didn't, I? didn't he, by bringing him on at half-time. Um, but ultimately, at international level, um, if you're not putting away your chances or you don't look like scoring when you make them, you're always climbing a mountain. Um, but I, I thought the Czech keeper did all right. He made some good saves. Um, I thought they made enough chances to get some out of the game, but they just looked... They looked... They didn't, they didn't have that, that killer instinct. They didn't have that, no. that bit of quality in the final third that you need. I would have played Kevin Nisbet because Nisbet's a bit... He's a bit kind of gal. He's a bit Scottish almost. It's a stupid thing to say, but he's a bit kind of like sure of himself. And I'd probably liked to have seen him play and have been a bit more aggressive trying to pin them back. But if Shake had played for us, yeah. he would have got something out of the game. They've expanded the tournament to 24 teams. And in that 24 teams, there will be teams that wouldn't have been anywhere near a European Championship tournament in the past. Unfortunately, I mean, as, as good a job as Steve Clark has done, Scotland are, uh, Scotland are one of those teams. They wouldn't have been involved in a 16-team European Championship. It's very, very hard for those teams. There's a, there's a big drop-off between those elite teams in Europe yeah. and, the guy, and the teams that have come in, you know, virtually, as, as Alan put it, by the back door. And Scotland are one of those. I said this last night on the telly. One of the top 10 all-time European Championship final goals. Surely, Schick's goal. Good goal. Alan, talk us through that. Come on, it's a striker. 49.7 yards and three seconds. I mean, and and a ridiculous... I mean, we were, it's, it's like a drawn five iron, isn't it? I mean, it's beautiful the way it flies through the air. Hang on a minute. You can't hit a five iron like that. No chance, <laughs> No chance. You might, it might come three feet off the ground. It might get on... My go-to cover five iron. <laughs> yeah, like, I was quite lucky, and I'm being, I'm being genuine. I was quite lucky because if I used to, if the ball used to break to me, I used to run. I, I, there's no way I was shooting 40 yards. I was running because no one's catching me anyway, so it wouldn't matter. 
So that was all right. The goal is sensational. I mean, the fact that it bounces to him, lovely, is, is nice as well. But the view from the back of the goal is sensational. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is. Because it's almost like a cartoon. And David Marshall realises, he's like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what Danny thinks, but I was thinking, Dan, he's obviously taking a bit of stick, but he's definitely too far out his goal, end of. But yeah. it's almost as though he was he was ball watching Danny, wasn't he? He was almost getting dragged closer to the, the halfway line because we were on the attack then, thinking there's no danger here because the ball's not going to get to Schick. And then all of a sudden, of course, Schick realises that to throw it out left peg with a proper draw outside the post and bring it in was, was it really was real sensational. <laughs> we'll talk about England, Scotland in a moment. Let's, let's in this part, though, just reflect on, on England's system, Danny, England's approach, and I think particularly England's game management, which seems to be what's impressed people almost more than anything. Would you go along with that? Well, I was pleased that they went with the uh, one sitter and two ahead in the middle of the park. I think that was key because what that does as a player for me, every time I used to play that way with one sitting and two ahead, you feel like you're on the front foot and you're going to go after the game. Every time you see the manager choose two holding players with maybe a 10, it's a bit more negative. The mindset's different. And Phillips was phenomenal. He had a great game. I was, I actually surprised me how well he did in that position. He doesn't play that role a lot for Leeds. You know, he tends to play the role where Rice plays. So I was really pleased. I think the... I think the last warm-up game probably pushed them into that because they, they started with two holding in the first half and in the second half they switched to the three and it worked much better. So that was a really smart move. And I think the other smart move tactically was playing Sterling. I thought he might play Rashford ahead of Sterling, but one of the two I thought should have played because of the obvious, which was the runs behind. Because Sterling kept getting in behind with his running off the ball, which is kind of what Rashford does off the left as well. There was a lot of talk, wasn't there, about playing Foden and Grealish with Kane, but for me, that, that three of them all like to come to feet more than go behind. So, again, he got that right. Um, I was surprised he played Trippier. I mean, I know he did all right and th there wasn't much for him to come up against on that right side for Croatia, but I still thought it was a strange choice, you know, with because uh, more because of what it does to Chilwell and Shaw in terms of their mindset of how they feel. You know, it's like, hold on, you're playing a right back ahead of me at left back. It's, it's, it's not, I still find it difficult to figure that one out because it's not as if he's a, a talker. You don't see him organising and, and getting after people on the pitch. But I think that's why, listening to the interviews afterwards, Danny, I think that's why I did play him because he was sort of talking Tyrone Mings through the game and he's got championship experience and he's obviously, if these are Gareth Southgate's words, hardened even more by playing in La Liga. I mean, it was a surprise, of course it was, but I think, that was the justification for playing Trippier, which begs the question, he might carry on playing him in there. I don't think he will. The problem you've got with playing Trippier is very simple, is that some, so many times the ball comes out wide and he ends up going back in when really a left footer would take it, open up the pitch. Then you can go wide or you can go inside to the forwards. It just it, 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 You become more one-dimensional. I think it's easier to play against. I'm talking about when you've got better opposition. You know, they'll show you out there, give it to him. Because you know he's going to play inside the whole time. He doesn't want to get it on his left and play down the line. So I, I think one of the others will come in the next game, personally. Martin? It was an encouraging start from England. I think it's careful that people don't go over the top. But in England have never won the opening game of the Euros before. They don't no. often win the opening game of a major championship, is the truth. No, absolutely. Um, the, the big hurdle come, comes later when we've got to win the first knockout game. Yeah, uh, we've ever won at uh, European Championship. We've never won a single knockout game. Um, so look, we all know that the, the, there's bigger tests ahead, but it was a, it was an excellent start all the world over. I mean, I know Croatia were quite disappointed, but they're the World Cup finalists. You know, they've beaten the World Cup finalists in the first game, and a team that sort of passed us to death the last time we played them. I know we went one 0 up, but um, Croatia were the much better team that day. Um, and I thought England were the much better team uh, on Sunday. So all you can do in three years is, is improve. And I realise that part of that is to do with Luka Modric now being <laughs> in an advanced stage in his career and he's not in his peak anymore. But having said that, um, there was a period when he suddenly got control of the game. I think it was quite, you know, about after about 20, 25 minutes and you're thinking, oh, here we go again. They're just, you know, they, they, they're going to control the tempo of it and everything. And then England took it back off them uh, in the second half. So, yeah, it was it was a very, very promising start. And it, and it hit the ground running um, in Russia as well, uh, Gareth Southgate. So it's the second time he's done it in a tournament. 
nothing like winning your first game to, to get the country behind you, get the country going, basically. Let, let's talk about Christian Eriksen and we'll do England-Scotland in a few moments' time. Alan, I mean, it's, it's thankfully, miraculously, and the medics are astonishing people and he's tweeted from his uh, hospital bed and he's given it the thumbs up and a statement and that is just the best news of Euro 2020, of course. What mm. about UEFA's protocols, this play tonight or play tomorrow lunchtime? I mean, thanks, play tonight, you know. What sort of earth state of mind would they have been in to play that evening, the Danes? Yeah, I think I might have struggled with the game. Uh, what is it, 90 minutes, uh, two hours yeah. afterwards? Yeah. It's quite it's quite extraordinary what happened, genuinely. I mean, I heard the story, and I don't know if this is true, that, that he'd FaceTimed or whatever he'd done and said to the lads, play, play, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm in the hospital, I'm being looked after, I'm okay. Or what he thought was okay. Because he's probably sitting in bed now thinking, yeah. what happened? What, what God's name happened there? Because it happened so quickly. Um, the protocol is such a difficult, difficult thing. I think as a player, I think I'd have been, I'd have been happier knowing, you know, overnight, how is he today? We'll play today. I think I'd have been happier with that. On the day, I thought it was a weird decision for them to start, but it might have been driven by Christian Eriksen himself, and the lads are almost like, they almost have to almost take Christian's voice and say, OK, he wants us to play, we have to play. They were in a position that they couldn't turn back. And I heard a couple of them from then thinking, you know, they almost wish they hadn't played. It's a very, very difficult situation. The bottom line is, listen, OK, the game went ahead, Denmark got beat, that's not good for them. Christian's OK, he's in hospital, and he'll get treated because no one knows how it happened, why it happened, and there'll be tests constantly to make sure he's OK. Yeah, because Danny, actually, as Ericsson pointed out, he doesn't remember anything, thankfully. It was far, It was obviously terrifying for everybody else. It was terrifying for his teammates more than it was for him because he didn't know what had happened. So as Alan says, to go and play two hours later. Oof. Well, I think you can sometimes think you're OK as well. well you know, when, yeah. when trauma happens in any form, mm -hmm. you, you look back and then only when you look back with hindsight, you realise how badly affected you were. I do. I agree completely with Al. I think he hit the nail on the head. I think when Ericsson spoke to the lads, they probably felt some sort of obligation to go and do it for him. I didn't realise that, that, that how trauma can get you physically and your mind. I mean, your mind can't be. It was ironic because before that they were dominating the game, weren't they? Mm -hmm. The contrast was so obvious. Um, and, and I know people have said, well, it should have been taken out of their hands. And there's, I mean, all you can do is learn from something like this, I suppose, as an organisation or as, as I don't know. It's what's the point in pointing fingers? The, the, the fact is, it's been played. He's okay. And that's the main thing. And have you got a view on UEFA in this, Martin? Uh, I've only got a view that it's UEFA and FIFA who have stuffed the calendar with more and more games left, just left them with no time in the schedule. So in the end, when the Danish players say we'll play, they seize on that like a like a drowning man. UEFA, oh right, that that because that gets them out of trouble. Because if the Danish players had said we don't feel right to play, mm. and the next option was the following okay. day, but even that. It's not an it's not an ideal option. The ideal option is you put the game back, and it becomes the last game of the group stage in a, in a, in about a week's time. But if you look at the schedule of this tournament, there is no space to do that anymore because coming back to the twenty fourteen tournaments and the forty eighteen World Cup that we're going to eventually end up with, and and stuff like that, and there's just no room in the schedule to to move anymore. I think it's a bigger problem than just UEFA's handling of one match. I think that is symptomatic of the wider problem of football which is which all the all of the administrators keep doing is forcing more and more matches to the into the calendar and putting greater and greater demands on on, on the same elite group of players with the Euro 2020 matches being played in the afternoon and the evening it's not too difficult for fans to keep abreast of events, but it was very different in 2002, the World Cup in Japan and South Korea, where the matches mainly were played at breakfast time. Pubs were open, people had a pint, they kept up to date with what was going on, but it was a very different sort of feeling. Well, here's Danny Mills, England's right back during that World Cup, on his memories of a first ever tournament in Asia. Obviously, Gary Neville got injured, uh, gave me my chance. But then, of course, David Beckham was injured, you know, with the, the metatarsal. 
Yuri Geller in front of the newspapers, you know, put your hands on the on the paper. Let's get David Beckham fit, you know, and all the the hullabaloo, if you like, uh, surrounding that situation. I was sat in a sat in a pub, I think, or in a bar, in a restaurant. Uh, came up on Sky Sports. Gary Neville's broken his metatarsal. <laughs> Shouldn't do that. Um, never wish ill of people. I thought that that might just mean that I get to go to the World Cup. Forget about playing. This is nothing to do with me or the team. We were, we were almost godlike. And this was purely down to Bex. He was at the height of his fame, I'm guessing, at, at that time. So yeah, I mean, everywhere we went, we were, there was just thousands and thousands of Japanese fans with England shirts on, all screaming, back home, back home. Anybody walked out in an England tracksuit, left the hotel or the training ground, Everyone was screaming Beckham. Not quite sure I looked like Beckham, you know, even with a mohawk. But that was how it was. It was just, it was literally Beckham mania. His friend was always very much like, we kill them, we kill them. I mean, it's not the most passionate of, of kill them, is it? You know, go out there and destroy the opposition. But it was just, it was always like, Mills, you kill them. And that was it, really. The Argentina game was, was immense. We obviously had all the issues from four years previously, obviously with, with Beckham and Simeone getting sent off. Simeone was still there. And then we go to Sapporo, obviously in the, in the very sort of north of Japan, and we're playing inside. This is very, very unusual. Walk into the, into the stadium, obviously roof closed, not pitch black, but slightly unusual. Cold because the air conditioning's on. You know, we, we, it's 30 degrees outside. We've walked in, it's freezing cold. So everyone getting jumpers. And then the first thing we've done is, right, who can hit the roof? It's like, you know, it's just, I mean, so unprofessional, really. Of course, no one got anywhere near it. And of course, we, we went on, we played well. You know, we defended for our lives, you know, towards the end of the game. And it was just one of those results where, you know, I think we, we earned every inch of that result. It was really strange because obviously, the time difference was a little bit weird, a little bit unusual. No one had quite had a tournament in that sort of time zone before. So on the way to the Denmark game, uh, I forget who, whoever it was, put a video on. And that's how old it is, put a video on on the bus. And it was the reaction of the fans from all the different cities around the UK when we'd scored against Sweden, when we'd scored against Argentina, when we won the game against Argentina, when we got through against Nigeria. And it was people, jumping in rivers at nine o'clock in the morning, town, you know, pubs and bars, you know, full. People having fry-ups for breakfast and drinking pints and watching the game because of the, because of the time difference. And I think really that sort of hit home that, wow, we're actually doing something really special here. So I think we went into that game absolutely buzzing, just going, yeah, the country's behind us. We are proper up for this. And we blew Denmark away. I still don't believe he meant it. I know that there's people around the world that go, oh, you're bitter, you're this, you're that. You know, he's, he's one of the most talented footballers we've ever seen. He never did it before that, that style of free kick. He never did it after that. I don't think he meant, I don't think he meant it. I think it was a deep cross that it got slightly wrong, caught on the breeze and, and caught David out. I mean, David was distraught after that. You know, you, you've seen him and obviously that was going to be his, his last tournament as well. But there was no fault apportioned to him whatsoever. The famous statement is we, we needed Churchill and we got Ian Duncan Smith. Um, I think it was accredited to Gareth originally. I think he's then passed it on and tried to blame Martin Keown. <laughs> um, so I'm not quite sure you know, who said it, but it's a difficult one. Sven never shouted. You know, he was always very, very quiet, very, very calm. That was how he was. You know? And he'd been very, very successful doing that. So why was he suddenly going to change? That was Danny Mills and his memories of the 2002 World Cup. Danny, before we talk about England, Scotland, what about Wales? A draw in Baku against Switzerland, which was probably not a bad result in the end, makes the Turkey match even more important. What did you think of the Welsh performance? I thought they got lucky. Uh, but in some ways, when you get lucky in a game and you feel like you've, you've kind of stolen a point, you can gain momentum from it give you a bit of, you know, a bit of confidence going into the next one, thinking maybe looks on your side. I, I, I thought Switzerland were decent. I thought they controlled the majority of the game. They had the best chances. Keeper had a great game, didn't he? And, um, you know, the, 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 the equaliser was a good goal. But other than that, they didn't really threaten. 
Um, the, the, the best thing for them is probably watching Turkey's performance. I mean, I don't think they can be that bad again. But when you're when you're looking at a team you're coming up against, you've just been some, you know, they looked, they didn't look fit to me. They looked well off the pace against Italy. There were so many of their players flagging. I don't know what they've been doing in, you know, the build-up. But if I was with the group of Welsh players, I'd be ecstatic we got a point. And, and looking at that game, thinking we've got a hell of a chance here. Um, but this is the game for them, isn't it? Because you wouldn't see them being able to cause Italy too many problems with how sharp they look. So it's a massive, massive game for Wales and they need one of the big boys to step up because too many of them weren't quite at it, were they, in the game for me? Ramsey got better in the last 20 minutes, didn't he? But Bale was a, was a bit ineffective throughout. Yeah, well, Ramsey likes getting on the ball. He goes, the game went on, yeah, he started doing a little bit more. But Bale needs the ball, needs the service. And when you're struggling to play out from the back and they're not, they're not particularly... Um, great playing out from the back where they, you know, they, they, they have to mix their game up because of the, the, the tools they've got. Um, it's hard to get Bale on the ball a lot. So he, he's going to have to go hunting the ball down to do a bit more. But it's, it's going to be interesting because, you know, the Turks who have said look bad, it, they've, they've been getting some rave reviews. Mm -hmm. And I, I expect a reaction. I mean, any group of players, when you get spanked in your first game, you expect a reaction. So... I think it's going to be an interesting game. I, I certainly wouldn't want to go either way and say who's going to get win, but you'd think if they don't win this one, it'll be over for the Welsh. Uh, Martin, Turkey beat Holland. We've had World Cup qualifiers, of course, because mm. of the weird year we've had, and Turkey beat Holland in a World Cup qualifier not long yeah, ago. Yeah. I think that's yeah. why we were quite intrigued by them. Mm. And as Alan's just, Alan and Danny have underlined it, they cannot be that bad again. Well, I thought they started that first. Ten, it was only about a spell of about ten minutes, but I, I thought they started or started a while, and then they then they sort of fizzled out in the first half, and they were non-existent in the second. Um, Baku was as near as they've got to a home match as well. Mm -hmm. um, Baku is a it's a dreadful location for a football tournament. You saw the. Um, we saw it at the Europa League final with Arsenal and Chelsea. The local interest was was limited, to say the least. Nobody cared about Wales versus Switzerland. I mean, yeah. the, the ground, it, it wasn't empty because of COVID. It was empty because, you know, the people of Baku didn't care about Wales versus Switzerland. And it's six hours from everywhere else. So you can't get there. You know, any of the people who are interested can't get there. It's a dreadful location and, and you know... Uh, you do wonder what, you know, UEFA, why UEFA keep going back to the oil and gas rich um, <laughs> nation of Azerbaijan for their matches. You really do wonder what's in it for them sometimes. But anyway, let's build up Friday night then. He said it himself, Steve Clark. No point sulking, no point feeling sorry for themselves. Tierney should no. be back. Um, I've already pointed out Scotland have already won in, in London this year at Twickenham. I hadn't won at Twickenham <laughs> since 1983. <laughs> wow. Come on, all the, I'm, I'm building it up for you. Give us a yeah. case for Scotland. Uh, let's talk about Twickenham again. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, and Danny's going to slaughter me here. Uh, no. I suppose, yeah, exactly. Um, I suppose really, and I said it already, I think regardless of the game against the Czech Republic and regardless of the result, it, is, it does have a different dimension, England and Scotland, because, you know, we don't have it that often. It's obviously the old enemy, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody's, to be honest, of all the fixtures, this is the one we've been looking forward to, for goodness sake. You know, England against Scotland at Wembley. And it will be different because the lads all know each other. So there's not that same dy dynamic in terms of it being a foreign country, as it were. And there'll just be a little surprise. I mean, I think the best we can get is a point, genuinely. I don't think we're good enough to go because we don't score enough goals. So if we get a 1 1, I think we'll swam the channel. But there will be a different feeling a different scenario and the whole feeling of the Euros will be gone and it will be England against Scotland. That's what gives us any kind of morsel of advantage that, that might go in our favour. But the bottom line is, and Danny and I know, we played in loads of games when you have better players and better quality players. That should be enough if you do your job properly. That's where Scotland lack and that's where I think we might be wanting, unfortunately. Yeah, I think there's always there's always um, hope. Of course, there is. I mean, joking aside, especially if you score first in a big game and then you can hang on to what you've got because yeah. Steve Clark does know how to organise a side defensively. They've shown that Scotland at times they can dig in. So, but they'd have to score first to get anything for me. 
I think the mm. difference this time, when you look at England, Scotland, and you look at obviously England's better quality, what you what I don't worry about with this England side is application. You know, they're not they're not that super they're not that big superstars, and it's not they're like golden generation where they walk on a pitch and just because they've got the names, they think they're going to turn a team over. This mm. is a team that's full of endeavour and hunger. You know, when you look at the likes of me, I, I use Mason Mount because he's a great example of someone who conducts himself the right way. Forget his quality. I'm on about his putting himself about. Sterling running off the ball. You know, Phillips and Rice in midfield, honest. The full-backs up and down. You know, the centre-halves, are they, they're nasty at the moment. They get hit. They're just stones. I like his aggression. He, they're all playing for the places. It doesn't seem to be a complacency about this England side. So, I don't. I, I would be amazed to see England fall flat on the face against Scotland because of a lack of, you know, because of complacency or a, or a lack of um, concentration. So I think it will come down to the quality and over. Obviously, the weather will wait and see, but I think over a ninety-minute period, the quality we've got will just wear the Scots down, and that's why for me, the only hope they've got really, the Scott, if they can get a goal, you know, get an early goal and hang on to it, because then they don't have to come out. Martin, you've just been talking about the schedule and too many matches and we've had the European Super League fiasco where they want Real Madrid v Liverpool every week, which is why this is so good because it doesn't happen every week and we look forward to it because it's because of its rarity. This is obviously what sports administrators never take into account because they're chasing the dollar. But this is why we're all so excited because it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that might be to England's advantage because the, 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 the sort of significance of a... Uh, an England Scotland match, um, it doesn't mean as much. I would have thought to Mason Mount's generation of, of players because it wasn't that it wasn't that big thing that it was when I mm. you know when I was growing up when we were all growing up when there was a home home international championships every year and, and things like that and the, and you got that sense of you know an intense rival. I mean, I can remember going to cover the matches for the first time. You you felt it in the press box. You know. Like, Guys that you 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 know you work with all year suddenly snarling at you and and, and stuff like that and um, that was just the English the, ones and that was just the English yeah yeah mostly yeah and um, whereas I'm, I don't know I mean if you're Phil Foden obviously you'll you'll play these guys in in age group matches and stuff like that but I don't think there's as but there's as much rivalry in in the average Premier League dressing room now you're more likely you're as likely to have a rivalry with the, the French players or the Spanish players yeah. or whatever as, as a group of Scottish players and obviously everyone knows the significance of the England-Scotland game so I'm not saying that ever goes away but I don't think it will phase this group of players certainly the younger ones as much as it has maybe phased teams in the past I'll tell you right now everybody's disappointed all over Scotland and all over Scottish fans but on Friday morning We'll be like this. Right. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into them. That's Wait, brilliant. Trafalgar, but that's <laughs> Trafalgar Square, and here we yeah. go. <laughs> I love that's that. The thing. People should see that's that because you get a proper cap. That's so good to see, Al. That's all we've got time for this week. I hope you continue to enjoy the Euros and I hope that you catch up with us next week as well. In the meantime, my thanks to Martin Samuel, to Alan McAnally and to Danny Murphy. Enjoy the England-Scotland game in particular. And for more news, views and interviews, go to mailplus.co.uk forward slash game on.